All right. Well, good evening. I do again appreciate you being here uh, this evening. Good to see the Hutchinsons back from uh, being a couple weeks of snowbirds. Uh, but anyways, we love birds and snowbirds. So uh, he'll have to show you his uh, some the couple that he met whenever he was on vacation, and uh, they were they were a little crazy. No. Uh, we do appreciate uh, them being back, and uh, good to see each one of you. Uh, we're going to look at, the, you know, since it's the beginning of the year, I wanted to look at uh, a thought of uh, in the beginning. In the beginning. The Bible says in Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, uh, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. You see, Genesis is a book of beginnings. That's where we're going to be this evening in the book of Genesis, chapter number 3. But the book of Genesis is a book of beginnings. Nearly everything that we know about mankind began in the book of Genesis. Uh, the beginning of man, the beginning of time as we know it, and the beginning of organic growth and things such as that. In Genesis chapter two, we uh, we begin uh, we see the beginning of woman, and uh, um, and then in chapter number four, the beginning of worship, also uh, the beginning of death, and so in Genesis uh, we see the beginning of all things, and as we proceed through Genesis, we see uh, the beginning of nations and governments and kingdoms, and we find the beginning of slavery and jealousy and idol worship, but this evening I want to focus on Genesis chapter number 3. Genesis chapter number 3, very uh, uh, wonderful portion of scripture here, and, and I'm going to show you five very important things that we see uh, first mentioned here in the book of Genesis chapter number 3. Uh, if you would turn there, we're going to read the first few verses here in Genesis 3. The Bible says in verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God hath made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your word and how it speaks to us, and it's alive, and it's powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, we ask this evening, Lord, that you would speak through your word, Lord, show us some things and uh, that we would just learn and uh, it will help us in our walk with you this year. Lord, I do thank you again for your love, your mercy, and your grace. Thank you for those who are able to come out tonight. Lord, for those who are unable, Lord, I pray that you would be with them. And I know there are some that are sick and just uh, the weather and just different things. But Lord, I pray that you would meet their needs physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Lord, I do thank you again for all that you do. We give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor that comes from it. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to look at uh, uh, five things, and uh, pretty quickly tonight, I want to keep you along. And, uh, but the first thing I want you to notice is the first mention of Satan. Satan, his first, his first time mentioned is here, and Sat uh, Satan's mentioned here. Satan was cast out of heaven. If you know uh, any the background here, in Isaiah chapter number 14, verse 12, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven? O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Of course, uh, if you realize what happened, Lucifer was started out to be a beautiful uh, creature that God created. And uh, he wanted to, uh, he said, I will lift up my throne and I will be exalted. And he had all those things that he wanted to do and pride got in the way. And uh, he once was a beautiful angel in heaven and uh, but through his pride and his ambition uh, to overrule God, he was dismissed from heaven. So Satan was cast out of heaven. This is the first mention of Satan in, uh, in the Bible. And uh, Satan is uh, the prince of the power of the air. In Ephesians 2.2 it says, Wherein in time past ye walk according to the curse of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. 
You see, some things you notice about Satan, he's subtle. The Bible says there, which means he's cunning, usually in a bad sense. It's, he means he's crafty, he's prudent, and he's subtle, he, he's sneaky, he's sly. He's, uh, you know, he he uh, doesn't come up and just bombard us, but he slips in through uh, different things in our lives that we allow through our eye gates and through our ear gates and even through our mouth gates. We allow these small things come into our lives and, uh, you know, before you know it, we're overtaken in sin. But also, he's the author of doubt, the Bible teaches us. Notice here, and he says, Yea, hath God said? He caused doubt to come across Adam and Eve there. He's like, Yea, hath God? Well, did God really say this? And uh, then he's the chief of all liars, the Bible says. Ye shall not surely die. And Satan says, Hey, God, you know... If you do this, it's gonna, God knows that it's going to make you like, like God's and you'll know. And you shall not surely die. Well, see, he is the enemy of God. He, he wants to separate us from God. And, and if we're saved, he can't do that. But he wants to separate us from our testimony and our walk with the Lord. See, he's a ruler of the powerful kingdom standing in opposition of the kingdom of God. You see, there's, there, are two, there is something waging... And that war is waging right now between good and evil, between the prince of darkness and those things that, uh, uh, that the Lord would have to work in our lives. You see, he skillfully directs and organizes a host of wicked spirits who do his bidding. Uh, if you understand what happened was when Satan was cast out of heaven and uh, cast out there, he, was, he, was, uh, he and one-third of the angels went with him. One third of the angels went from heaven and, and they are doing his, they, those are the wicked demons and they are uh, bidding, doing his bidding. You see, if the scripture will help Satan's cause, can I tell you that Satan will use the scriptures to his advantage? He'll, he'll use it, he'll, he'll twist and, and that's what a lot of your uh, false religions do today. They'll twist what God's word says. See, Genesis 2.17, it says, But the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of, for in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. That's what God told Adam and Eve. You see, Satan twists the truth. He says, Ye shall be as gods. See, he's causing doubt. And, and I can tell you this, that Satan will cause doubt in your mind if we allow him to. Uh, he twists what the scripture says. Satan will one day be cast into the lake of fire. So this is just some things that we learned about in the first, in the first about here in Genesis chapter 3. You see, he attempts to overthrow God, and, but he, one day he's going to end up in the lake of fire, which burned with fire and brimstone. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 20 verse 10, And the devil that deceived them were cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and forever. Folks, he's going to get his due reward. He's going to get what's deserved to him. So I see the first mention of Satan, but also there's a first mention of sin. The first mention before this, you don't read about it, but there, look there in verse 6 and 7. It says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and uh, the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and ca uh, gave also unto her husband with, with her. And did, he did eat, and the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Their eyes were open, but they did not become as gods. However, uh, they saw their nakedness. They saw what they, that they were naked. They had been naked the whole time, but they didn't acknowledge it. They didn't understand that. They didn't know what naked meant. But if you look at verses 9 through 11, God saying to them, Who told you that you were naked? Where did you learn about this nakedness? Let's look at it in verse 9 through 11. It says, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Who, Where art thou? And he said, I heard a voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I have commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat of? Does anyone in here think that God didn't know that he did that? I believe God does things like that. He makes us to reveal, uh, He wants us to admit our sins. 
He wants us to admit that we've done wrong. And because God knew exactly where he was. God knew he was going to do it before he did it. You know, the dis didn't surprise God by any mean. See, the, the Garden of Eden, before the sin had entered in, the Garden of Eden was perfect. Perfect for man. All that God created was good, the Bible says. And in the garden, Adam had all that he could possibly need. Everything at his fingertips. He had it all. Adam had dominion over all that was uh, everything that was in the garden. Dominion means to, uh, to prevail against or to reign, to bear rule over or to, to take. All the earthly kingdom was Adam's. It reminds me of what uh, Satan told Jesus, didn't he? He said, oh, if you'll just bow down, he says, I'll give you the kingdoms. See, perfect for all of man, but also is perfect for all of creation. You see, all, everyone, uh, all the animals got along and there wasn't any fighting and all the, the sin hadn't reigned and ruled yet. The Bible says in Romans 8, 21, Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Because of sin entered in the world, hey, listen to me, there's pain and suffering and, and travail uh, all through uh, creation now, but also it was perfect for God. Genesis 131 says, And God saw everything. He saw everything that He had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning was the sixth day. I tell you, sin, before sin entered into man's life, the Garden of Eden was perfect, but can I tell you, sin is attractive. You know, it's attractive, it's pleasant to the eyes, the Bible says here in verse 6. Can I tell you, don't be attracted by sin. It will lure you. Satan will say, look at this. Isn't it beautiful? And you know, with looking through human eyes, we say, yeah, that is beautiful. I want that. I desire that. You put it on there, whether it's money, whether it's be fame or fortune or a nice job or whatever. You put it, you're fill in the blank wherever it hits you. And, sin, and Satan will put that in front of you and, and show peace it and, and show you how nice it is and how beautiful it is just to attract you and it will blind you and it will cause you to fall. Can I tell you this? Samson didn't even realize it. The Bible says he wist not that he lost, that the Lord had departed from him. Samson, because of sin, Samson lost his power with God. He lost his protection from God. He lost the presence of God. He, and he lost the pleasure of God because of sin. Can I tell you, sin, it may look beautiful on the outside, but there's a, there's a worm on the inside. It's, gonna, it's like it will eat at you. But then, not only is it say the Bible teaches that sin can be attractive, but also it's pleasurable. It's pleasurable. You know, if sin wasn't pleasurable, we wouldn't have a problem with it, would we? I mean, it'd be easy. Oh, that's sin. I don't want to have nothing to do with that. That's easy. I don't want to... No, but sin is pleasurable. The Bible says, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So the Bible does teach us that sin is, hey, listen to me, it feeds the flesh. And our flesh is weak. Sin also, can I tell you, not only does it look good and, and it's pleasurable, but can I tell you, it destroys. I can't tell you how many families I've seen destroyed because of sin. I can't tell you how many men have been destroyed because of sin. Can't tell you. See, all sin is, is it's like a cancer that destroys the soul of man. James 1.15, it says, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Listen, folks, sin may be attractive. It may lure us in. It may be something that, man, I just want that. And I tell you that it will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than, want, than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay. If you're involved in this practice of sin, you're on a road to death and destruction. Notice what sin did to the family of Adam. There in Genesis 4 or 5 it says, 
But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord came and said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is our countenance fallen? If thou dost well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou dost not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Imagine the regret, the heartbreak, and the sorrow that Adam and Eve had. They had to have had because of what happened to their son. And they had to bury Abel there, and sin will always, always bring much sorrow in our lives and much heartbreak and regret. Sin destroys families, brings remorse. And heartache all to Adam. Every day, I believe Adam lived with that. Every day, as Adam was tilling up the soil, tilling up the ground, he was reminded of his sin. Every day he passed by the grave of Abel, he was reminded of his sin. Sin destroys, but also I see sin. You say, what is sin? Sin, the Bible says in 1 John 3, 4, it says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth against the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. God said that, hey, this is His commandments. These are the things. And it's not just the Ten Commandments, but anything that doesn't please God. Lying, cheating, cussing, smoking, uh, adultery. You list it. And we say we try to put uh, sin in a box and say, okay, this little white lie is not as bad as adultery. Can I tell you, sin is what caused our Savior to go to the cross Jesus Christ died for our sin. You know, see, sin is an offense to all. Matthew 18, 7, it says, Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom that offense cometh. That, that offense, what that word means, it means trap or snare. It has the idea of a sapling. And back in the war times when they would tie saplings, and what they would do, they'd tie those saplings down and they would uh, bring them down and then they would launch... Uh, people because of it. And that's the stumbling block of what it's talking about here. Sin is a fence. It's a bent sapling trap. And sin will trap you. But also I see number three, the first mention of the Savior. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful for the Savior there? Look there in verse 15. It says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Who's that talking about? That's talking about the Lord as he hang on the cross there. What happened? His heels were bruised, weren't they? But he smashed the head of the serpent whenever he went to the cross and died for our sins. You see, God's plan before creation, God had a plan before creation. The plan was always and was and always was Jesus Christ. Jesus had a, God had a plan, Ephesians 1, 4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Sometimes we have this thought that, well, since Adam sinned, then God had to come up with another plan. No, God had a plan before the foundations of the earth. This was God's plan. He knew that man was going to sin. He knew that he was going to send a Savior. And there had to be a perfect spotless lamb to take the sins of the world. And of course that was Jesus Christ. The plan is not an act of desperation. God has never lost control of this universe. We need to get a hold of that. God had, just because we think the world's you know, going crazy and all the things that are going on in this crazy world. God hasn't. He still reigns. He's still in control. You see, He has always had a Savior for man. He, before there was sin, there was a Savior. Before there was a need, a plan was in operation. There has always been a cross in God's plan. It's not been an afterthought. We need to realize that. The plan of redemption is not something that God had come up with after Adam's sin, but God had already constituted that. But then I want you to notice... Not only God's plan, but God's promise. If you're not a Christian, 
this is what it's for. The Bible says, and as Moses will lift up in the, uh, uh, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the, that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. See, if you believe, then you can be saved. God's promise is that simple. I know there's been some that have been dealing with uh, some folks about salvation, and uh, they're having a hard time. Some of them are having a hard time with understanding the simplicity of the gospel and the simplicity of salvation. It's that easy. You realize you're a sinner. You realize that you can't save yourself. You ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins and come into your heart and save you. It's that simple. It's God's promise. If you ask Him, He'll forgive you. If you mean business with God, He will mean business with you. But then I want you to notice God's procurement for His people there in Romans 8.32. It says, He that spareth not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall, not with, uh, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? God's so good to us. God's given us the, pro the plan. He's given us the promise. And He's promised to take care of us. Then I want you to notice, number four, I want you to notice the first sentence, the first mention of the sentence. Look there in verse 16. It says, Unto the woman He said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children and thy desire shall be to the hus to thy husband now i don't i'm not trying to be ugly i'm not trying to be mean but god intended the husband to be over his wife god intended for the husband to be the leader of the home not only that but god intended the men to be the leaders in the church the problem with most churches today is that the women have to take the position that's not theirs to take. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just telling you what the Bible teaches, that we are to be the leaders, men. God's, that's what God has put us here on earth for, to be the leaders of our homes and of our church. Of course, we're under chef as uh, Jesus Christ is over the church, the head of the church, the pastor is there is to be the under shepherd, and the deacons are there to be spiritual help, and uh, and that's the that's what God ordained to, to be, and so we need to understand that men are instructed to be the leaders. Look, look there in Genesis three seventeen it says, and unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, what was the problem? I heard one man said the problem was that Eve wore the plants in the family. All right, I got some laughs on that one. But that's, that's the, the I, I think that's what God has shown us right here is that if Adam, I, I mean, God, I know God had a plan and God knew that it was, it was going to happen, but Adam should have been the spiritual leader and said, no, Eve, then we're not going to do this. Men, you need to get a backbone. When your wives don't, they want to, do the wrong, and I'm not, men, you want to do the wrong things too, but you need to be a spiritual leader. God intended for you to be. I need to be, be the spiritual leader God intended me to be, and if my children or my wife wants to do something that's outside of God's word, I say, no, we shouldn't do this because God has told us, hey, we shouldn't be doing these things. Men, get a backbone, start living the way God wants us to live as leaders in the home. That's good preaching. You see, every wrong must be made right. Someone has to pay, had to pay for all the wrongs. And of course, Jesus Christ did that. Judgment was necessary. This is the first mention of judgment or sentence in the Bible. Jesus Christ was giving judgment here. If God compromised on sin, His holiness would be lost God must require judgment. Listen, if he had accepted sin without sacrifice, his holiness would mean nothing. God is holy. 
Adam hearkened to the voice of his wife rather than the word of God. Folks, it's better to obey God rather than man. Don't permit anyone or anything to cause you to reject the word of God. Adam did and it cost him a great judgment. A judgment that, that was hard and sorrowful and damning and still effective today. Genesis 3.24 says, So he drove out the man, and he placed at the, the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and the flaming sword which turneth every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Imagine with me as Adam leads his wife out of their home and out of the, the vile wickedness outside of the protection of God. See, judgment's no respecter of persons, folks. It can happen to you as well. Our nation has moved away from judgment. We can see that for wrongdoing. We don't want to judge people because of their wrongdoing or things like that. But when the large part of our country can excuse the actions of uh, some of our past leaders, can I tell you that we've, we've, sir, we've gone past judgment and we've allowed uh, every man to judge themselves. And, and to, but can I tell you, wrong is wrong. And right is right, whether it's in my house, your house, or the White House. It doesn't matter. You see, judgment still is executed with God, though. That's never going to change. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But then the last thing I have for you, last thing mentioned, is the first mention of sacrifice. Where would we be without the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? There in verse 21 it says, Unto Adam also... And to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. God who was sinned against made a sacrifice for the sinner. The sinner could not make his own sacrifice. Their nakedness was now oppressive to them. And they didn't know they were naked before they had sinned. Now they must be covered because of their sin. God who was perfect made a sacrifice for the perpetrator. God's grace allows sacrifice for the guilty. Without God's sacrifice, the guilty would be doomed and damned forever. Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful for the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made when He left the portals of glory, took on a robe of flesh and blood, come down to being born of a virgin, lived some 33 years on this earth without sin. There was no guile or sin found in Him. He sacrificed his own life for you and for me. See, God took a, took a living being and made a way to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness. In doing this, God was showing the world that a heavenly sacrifice was going to come. This was all, foreshad this was all foretelling what was to come. He said there in verse 15, he says, his, He uh, shall bruise his heel and he shall bruise thy head. See, God was telling us right there in the beginning what God was going to do. He was going to send a Redeemer. He was going to send Jesus Christ. The heavenly sacrifice was born in a manger, grew up in a hostile society that was motivated by religious prejudice. See, Hebrews 10.4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins but because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Folks, we have, we have a Redeemer. And our blood, our sin had been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you've been saved, folks, we've been redeemed. We have a home prepared for us in heaven. And I'm thankful for that. As we look at this, these first mentions here in Genesis chapter 3, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you that uh, there, God has a plan. God has a plan. And that plan included Jesus Christ coming to this earth to die for sin of all mankind. If you're here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, let today be the day of salvation. And now is the accepted time. With every head bowed and eyes closed. As we mentioned this morning, that 2018 needs to be a, a year that we have a good testimony. And that we share our testimony with others. Let me remind you. Let me remind you that that same theme goes on 
this evening that we need to tell others about the love of Christ. See, that's the reason Jesus came. That's the reason in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You're here this evening and maybe the Lord put someone on your heart to share with you. Because can I tell you, there's a sentence coming down. Judgment's coming. The Bible says every knee shall confess and every, every tongue shall confess and every knee shall bow at the name of Jesus. One day, one day, whether they want to or not, but every person will bow their knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe God put someone on your heart. I want to challenge you to just pray for them and ask God this year, if, it's, if He gives you one person to witness to, may you be a witness to that person this year and pray for them every day. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I do thank you again for your love, your mercy, and your grace. Lord, I do thank you for these first mentions here in Genesis chapter number 3. First mention of Satan, Lord, how Satan came into this world to uh, try to destroy uh, uh, the cause of Christ. But we're so thankful that uh, he's going to be sentenced one day. And Lord, his sentence is to be in eternal fire and brimstone. Lord, I'm thankful that there was a Savior that came. And Lord, that uh, the sacrifice that He made, Jesus Christ made for the sins of this world. Lord, I do thank You again for all that You do. May we give You all the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Brother Adam's going to begin playing softly. God spoke to your heart tonight. I'm just going to encourage you to find a place at the altar. give you a couple announcements as uh, a couple of the men come forward we'll take up this evening's tithes and offerings next sunday is our vision sunday and just kind of roll out the theme for uh next year of course you i mentioned this morning but our theme up here is uh i will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help psalm 121 1 and uh we'll be having these we got these uh tvs instead of the uh, uh um instead of the banners and in the long run, it's going to save us money, but also we'll be able to put our missionaries up there and be able to hear uh, when our missionaries come in and be able to hear them and see the slides much clearer. And so I'm excited about that. I do appreciate, again, the men that were able to help us with that. And uh, so uh, then I want to mention on Sunday the 21st, January 21st, we're going to have a business meeting and uh, just go over our yearly uh, budget and things such as that. And then on uh, January 26th, as a teen activity, we'll be leaving the church at 5 o'clock, and that's uh, we're going to go to uh, Perfect North uh, uh, Ski Slopes there. All right. I think that's all the announcements I have. Brother David, sir, would you please ask a blessing? in a word of prayer and again it's good to have brother greg back and miss suzanne back brother greg sir would you close us in a word
this place we have to worship. Thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, thank you for our pastor and his family. And Lord, to continue to work with the courage and power of the pastor. Lord, as he leads and teaches the flock, Lord, we just pray, pray we just continue, Lord, to uh, see the work of God in this place. And we pray to keep us in one accord. We pray to you to the us in the end. Father, keep all close to you. Father, we just thank you for the message tonight. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for watching over us and keeping us safe and protecting us and go with us. And now I pray as we travel, we pray in Jesus' name.